Okay, good evening, everyone. We're going to kick off. I think there are a few stragglers, but I know, I also know there is a film that's showing shortly after this. So um, I don't want us to overstay our welcome. Thank you very much for joining us for this panel discussion. This is the fourth one we've had here at the Garden Cinema. We've had one about um, producing, one on festivals, one on documentaries, and this one is on, I'll call it film writing, film journalism, uh, film reporting. Mm. Um, and all the associated, yes. <laughs> associated jobs. I am really delighted to introduce Jacob Stallworthy. Hello. And, Thank um, you. And Jack Shepard. Hello. Both film journalists. Not particularly relevant tonight, but I'm also a huge fan of these guys who are the presenters of a podcast called The Lost Boys. And they talk about the series Lost, <laughs> much maligned series Lost, which is excellent. So I'm thank you very much for that. <laughs> <laughs> we won't talk about that tonight. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's it's good, it's, this is a great <laughs> cinema and it's so good to be here. <laughs> um, can I ask you, first of all, a bit about your background in the field? Um, how you, you how you got work as a film journalist? So maybe Jacob will start with you. Sure. So I um, always loved writing about, well, love watching films and love writing about films. But never really did much about it if i'm honest like i look back i, I kind of wasted a lot of time at uni and stuff i should have done a lot more um so when i finished when i graduated from uni i kind of had a lot of time I, I had a lot to catch up with and i thought how do i go about this go, you know doing something that i love for a living so i kind of went i went around about way i started writing more doing more stuff that i should have done before for you know unpaid gigs for websites and whatnot which was just a simple case of emailing and, you know, I'll do it for free. Yeah, sure. And then you go to pre-screening. It's great, you know. But um, I also got a, a fully paid full-time job working in film PR. And I thought to myself that maybe getting a job in PR, maybe I could then meet. You're, a, you're, you're kind of dealing with journalists day in, day out. Maybe you can get some advice and see what they say. And it kind of happened that way. After three years, four years, I um, saw that there was an internship at the Telegraph and you know luckily I lived in London lived at home still so I didn't really have to worry about um quitting a job <laughs> and rent yeah so that was you know you, you think about that you're like very blessed in that regard but I just kind of went to the Telegraph had the interview and I kind of said to them look I know there are a lot of people there who've been to journalism school they've been to forever they've been writing for many years I haven't really got that but I've got a lot of passion I want to get going and and I, it got me the internship and since then I've kind of never looked back so that's kind of my journey into it. And it's it's really a lot of luck, but a lot of persistence. Um, yeah. But, you know, if you love film, you just you just do it, don't you? I guess. Yeah. Um, just quickly, how did you get your job in PR? Did you just, was it just a straight application? Yeah, so that's actually started with an internship as well. And it was, I saw it kind of like about three months before I graduated. And I, I, so I started thinking about it, not the, after graduation, before graduation. But it just so happened that I got an internship at a BFI and it, was it was starting the day after my graduation ceremony so i literally went from graduation to work and um it was unpaid which looking back now it's i think they don't do this internship anymore but i think what they do it's not it is paid now because it was very i got like five pound a day for lunch um <laughs> and uh yeah so i did the bfi and and do you know what that was three months and it happened it was just at the right time because it was it was the later end of the year so it was the london film festival and I got, I mean, I got my, what I didn't get paid, I got, I, it got paid back to me in dividends with like the things I did. Like as a, as a wide eyed newcomer, I was so like at these premieres and people were there and you're like, what, this is insane. But the, it was the people, I, a, a woman I met named Caroline Jones, who was at the BFI, who she was a freelancer. She moved on to Organic, a place called Organic. Yeah. Um, who have now, who have grown and grown and grown and grown. They were just new when I started. But she went there and then she got me in there for a year. And then I got a job at Premier, um, which is like the one of the biggest agencies, I'd say. Everyone's who worked in PR has worked in Premier at some point in time. And so yeah, it was it was a it was a fun it was a good trajectory in terms of PR. Um and I'm but it was meeting people within those jobs that then got me to the journalism stage. Yeah. They'd give you advice. So they or they knew that I didn't want to work in PR, they knew and they'd go, I've seen this you should apply for that or I know that person I'll put in a word and it was meeting up with amazing journalists who worked at like Empire or even Total Film or other magazines 
who would happy, happily have a coffee with you and give you advice, you know? It's, it, it was literally just like th- those people I look back at, I could literally read off names in my mind. I'm like, they were so instrumental and helpful. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Jack, how about you? First steps in, in journalism and film writing. So I, I always wanted to be in a band and I always thought I was going to be, you know, the next Alex Turner. And, um, and so when that didn't happen at uni, I went, what can I do? Uh, I can, I can write cause I did like politics and philosophy years and years ago. Yeah, I know, ran crazy. Um, and, and that didn't really work out. I mean, I just didn't know what to do. And so I ended up doing a three month journalism course in Brighton, um, which was aligned with the Argus local newspaper. Um, and from there, um, I just ended up doing some work experience at The Independent um, and of various other places like the Worthing Herald, Kerrang! for a week, just lo- anything I could I could go and do. I was doing and I was living in Brighton at the time and I had only been with my girlfriend for three months. I made her move in with me because I couldn't afford the rent. Um, it was all very quick. And then, uh, and so then, yeah, with this independent, I just found someone's email and I just kept pestering them and then ended up doing a week's work experience there. And then while I was there, uh, I ended up messaging the person who ran like the gaming. There wasn't really a gaming part, but I, and I was just like, just let me in. Um, and I was like, oh, I can write about music or something. Uh, and, uh, and that, it, so I always thought, having wanted to write about music or do music, I was like, oh, I can do stuff like, I could be like, you know, independent music correspondent, I could be super cool. Um, and then gradually they were like, okay, there's a there's opening on the culture desk, which is about music, about gaming, all this stuff. We just need someone to come in and do like days, body on the desk to just churn out rubbish. Um, so I did that. And then it, it was just a real mixture of stuff. Like I just said yes to everything, I think. Um, you know, if it was like, sub editing on a saturday night until midnight or covering eurovision or strictly or 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 whatever and you just kept saying yes and then it was through that that i kind of fell in love with film um because we just ended up going to loads of really cool screenings and stuff and i think jacob helps we became quite quick friends fast friends at the independent working together i I should say that when i got random shifts at the independent I turned down another job and I was like, because it was between internships and then and then suddenly this job at the independent arose or like a few shifts. But I, when I worked those shifts, it, it was on another department and I remember looking at Jack thinking, he lives the life I want to live. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Yeah, no, man. I thought he was cool. No, and then I met yeah. him. First time and last time anyone's ever thought that about <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but it was, uh, you know, and that, that was how I thought I wanted to write about music and then I started interviewing bands that I liked. And I realized I didn't like them because um, <laughs> they're all just, you know, they were like, as, I, as people. Yeah, as people. Oh. I mean, I always thought I wanted to be like these people. And then I was like, no, I don't. Um, and I also think within film, like I, I remember the first press conference I did was um, Avengers Age of Ultron. Um, and I was like, wow, this seems like a massive movie to do and just go sit in and kind of write stuff about. And because and, no one else on desk liked like the superhero movies or anything and i can't say i'm the biggest fan but it was just a way in and you know they're so popular you write about them online and they do so well like your articles do gangbusters like well they did back then they did, yeah. um not so much anymore but and, and they did so well and and so i kind of like found that as my niche on like a major desk to be able to write about that stuff so like my first junket i was in a room with like paul rudd and it was just like how is this happening? And my immediate thought was, wow, your head is massive, like <laughs> physically huge. I think this is what people don't realize about actors. It's like their heads are really big. Um, I'd like to know what Paul Rudd thought of you. He actually. was probably like, this guy is like 23. Why are you in this room? Uh, <laughs> and so it was, you know, and then I, I got my first scoop because it was, it, this was for Ant-Man and, and Michael Douglas came in and he said something stupid that he shouldn't have said. And, and then I wrote it up and it was, and it did very well. And, you know, it was, it was through all that stuff, but it was through saying yes and just jumping on every opportunity. And then after I was there for four, five years or so, and then, um, and then I left there and I joined the Total Film team. So I was the online editor for Total Film for, for four years and then I've recently gone freelance. So, well, yeah. I wanted to ask you about this. Why have you gone freelance? <laughs> well, um, 
I, there were other opportunities. So now I, I, I still do journalism, but I also work with my, my brother who's here tonight on a, on a YouTube channel um, where we kind of, we can do our own thing and, and it's just really fun. It's, it's not film related. It, we do editing as in editing of videos and stuff, but um, it's just a very different thing. And I think, so Total Film doesn't have its own website. It's all hosted on gamesradar.com. And this was a, business decision made by them which it, w it was a silly one and, and they should have kept it as total film but um i found it quite frustrating kind of being an appendage to a gaming website and so you it wasn't like our own thing it wasn't like empire empire have empire online and we had total film but it was part of this other website and so it was just quite tough navigating that circumstance because the company it was a company called future and they own so much stuff like tech radar just like tom's guide loads of stuff and um it was quite complicated sorry this is a really long answer <laughs> but um it was just it was just quite difficult but i i still write for total film magazine all the time and and sfx magazine as well i mean i think the publications themselves fantastic and you know i think everyone who loves film should get a subscription because the writing is so good and you know the especially the reviews i love all the reviews in there i've never seen myself as a reviewer i i i struggle i just can't do it but um i love interviewing and so i mean that was all of my highlights from my time there are, are nearly all kind of like doing interviews and stuff yeah but also lovely teams yeah. well i wanted to ask you about about the ways in which you work because you're mainly freelance and you are uh jacob you're at the independent as a, as a st staff member yeah. so can you talk us through what your a day of work would look like for e mm. for each one of you for either of you sure. Sure. yeah so I, i've been independent for eight years in january which is mad um if half the years have been without you which i know is poor you, man. yeah I know. <laughs> um but it's funny because you put I love what I do, like every aspect of what I do, but a lot of it, I think a lot of people come in sometimes and they just don't enjoy the, um, let's just say, the less fun aspect. Like you say, the evening stri Strictly Come Dancing shifts. You know, I write about film. I love film and I love TV and music, but I write mainly about film and TV. But um, I do a lot of fun stuff within the job, but the day-to-day -day isn't what I put on Instagram or isn't what I put on Twitter it's the same with everyone everything really so a day a day for me would be I wake up in the morning news 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 ne literally doesn't sleep so you you and we've got a bigger team now so news it, it's less stressful than it used to be when we were there we would have to write a lot in a short space of time and you look back now and I'm like that wasn't you know I'm not proud of that because now we can put a bit of time and, and, and love into what we do but it's news and um, it's about just tapping into what you know will do well for the independent and um, not wasting time with something that won't. And, you know, I mean, I mean, there are things like you say, like Marvel used to do well, it doesn't really do well anymore. So you, you, you only do the lines. It's, it's about isolating in your head and you get a good gauge of it when you've done it for eight years. You kind of see something. It's like your Robocop and you're like, that will do well, that won't, that won't, that won't, that will. You're very good at this, though, because you know what does well very instinctively. Yeah. But I also think, I mean, I don't know if people realise like quite how like when you look at the news like it's so traffic driven like people are going for like you know you have to go for the seo terms like we always used to get called up on writing pieces like uh how long is this movie how to watch blah 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 how to watch the marvel cinematic universe in order blah blah and you go like well those just do so well that's why you write them mm. and that's why and as much as i'd love to write like 20 pieces about past lives or some really great indie film it's really tough to because you, they don't get the traffic and so you can't and the thing it Getting people to read about something new that they don't already know about is really tricky. You got to be clever. You, you, you can't. To, there yeah. are ways around it, right? And th there are, and but you can't do it all the time because it's people see through it. So you got to wait almost like you're really passionate about. So you're right. And and the news for me, the morning is news. Then the afternoon is um, something I've been working on, whether it's an interview with someone, and I've got a, you know a deadline coming up, and I can just get cracking with that. Or even like going out to do um, interviews for a TV show, but you're not going to write as a feature. You're going to do it as and get news lines from that. But it's like good to be in front of the person getting your own line as opposed to writing it because Metro covered it, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's it, that's where the fun part of the day to day comes is trying to be the person who people, they read the news, but you've reported that news. 
which is really easy to do. I say easy. I, I, I don't know if it's easy, but for someone on a politics team or someone who on the foreign desk, who they are doing what people would, would class as real journalism day in, day out. But it's actually really hard for us to do that day in, day out because especially, it, it just is hard. It's impossible to do that every day. Whereas that's what some people's jobs are. So I do think people, I, I worry, and I think a lot of people come in, they worry about the news cycle because they think that's not what i'm here to do but it's like you kind of have to do that stuff to do the stuff that you can then be proud of um so the morning is very kind of okay i've got to do this got to get it out of the way but i have fun with it you know i think you learn to have fun with it and then the rest of the day is um but there's other stuff within that you know like as i'm sure you remember there's a desk right there's a whole there's a whole department around you a culture department and um things have to be uploaded things to you know and, and and they have to look good on the page and they have to be everywhere has to be a, a title has to be a talent things like that stylistically um and it's a lot of that as well um so it's not all fun and games but it is instrument you have to do that stuff to do the fun stuff you know it makes sense yeah and uh and how about you chuck because obviously you work on different, different across different platforms for different people. Your time's your own. How do you structure your, d your working day? Uh, it's a struggle because you just you wake up sometimes. You're just like, what am I going to do today? I don't know. It's it, it, you, you kind of. I mean, when I'm doing my, th there are certain days. So I do stuff like my YouTube days with with Finn, my brother, and then I do kind of my journalism days where, at the moment, most of the work that I'm doing is. I've been really lucky that it comes to me. I have people kind of come and ask me to do interviews. So like this week I spoke to Eli Roth for Thanksgiving and then the team behind Godzilla minus one, um, which was really fun because that was the first time I've done an interview through a translator in that way. And it was these, it was these Japanese filmmakers that it was just fascinating experience. Um, so that, that's been really lucky. I mean, sometimes I wake up and I just try and pitch a million pieces and then I get really annoyed because no one wants them and it's just frustrating. And then other days I'll have loads and loads of work and be speaking to fantastic people and, and stuff like that. It really, it's really swings and roundabouts. There's, there's some days where it feels really empty and some days where it's mega busy. Um, I mean, the, the real structure again was like when I was working on a desk and when I was an editor, especially with kind of people, I had a team of six people and all some of them, it, it was a real range. It was from some really young reporters who was their first job out of uni, maybe doing a journalism course or something to, to more experienced people who'd been doing it for a few years. And that was really interesting because I guess I, I would kind of help them understand like what would do well online, what to write about, and then try and help them spur on ideas. So we'd pitch stuff and we'd talk about it and then most of my day at that point was just editing other people's work so I wasn't doing that much writing it was kind of a like it was nice to write a, maybe a piece a week or so just on something that I was passionate about and I could find time for um, and then a lot of it was just uh, just managing business stuff like you kind of just go into you know just meetings on meetings on meetings talking with higher ups in your company about Sorry, this is really boring. That is a really boring way of saying it. like, oh, meetings. Um, yeah, but that's but that's the nature of it. It that's was, it yeah. Was I guess know, that's yeah. the reality of like being an an editor at one of these places is you you have to do all the paperwork and stuff. Like, I mean, I get more jealous of some people on the mag team would be doing some awesome things going out, but then you know, uh, Jane Crowther, the editor of Total Film, would be in meetings and meetings like PR meetings. So much of it was about relationships with PRs mm -hmm. and kind of making sure you're going to lunch with Disney or, or someone like that, you know, Warner Brothers and, and keeping in there with them and then battling for the interviews as well. Cause you have mm -hmm. to, you know, the, um, I think, I think something that's maybe changed in the industry more is there are so many people who want interviews and so many people who have platforms and stuff, whether it's, smaller podcasts or, or PRs into in inviting influencers in to do interviews, this kind of thing. It's a real mixture. It's changed quite a lot because we used to be, used to think like, oh, you know, the Guardian's going to come in and get an hour with someone and the Independent's going to get like 45 minutes or something. And now it's like, well, actually, we could chop this time up into speaking to like superhero.com and somewhere else and somewhere else and somewhere else and somewhere else. And, somewhere else. and, it, and so it becomes quite tricky and for many people, that's, I think it, like in many ways, it's a great thing because it gives a lot of people an opportunity to speak to these people. But in other ways, it means that you can't do and you get less deep dive interviews with these actors where you can't go as in depth. You don't see that profile with like 
Benedict Cumberbatch, which is enlightening. You don't see that that often, unless it's like GQ or somewhere like that. It's it, it's just changing, like the nature of these interviews. I don't they, know. They are. I that's why I've tried to make it my thing because we. Ha I do. I'm a culture reporter, so I have to do the, a lot of the news. But we have like people who do a lot of interviews. For, but like because I've been there for so long, I kind of get to pick and choose who who I interview, which is lovely. Yeah, but not not. I don't do it a lot. A lot. I, I get to pick and choose because it's, ve it's it, I don't know, it's like once every two months or something. But I like to kind of go for someone who I know The Guardian hasn't gone for, The Times hasn't gone for, that, that yeah. you know you can get like a meaty bit of time with and sometimes you get to like go away to do it somewhere because they're like, wait, you want to interview like Anne Dowd? What? Okay, cool. Like, yeah, sure, you know. And then you, that's for me the fun part because I watch so much film and so much TV and have like just interests that I think a lot of the people on my desk might not have because they because of we have different interests right and I get like really passionate about just random people <laughs> and they're like and I'm like can I can I be the person who does that and they're like yeah sure C can you though so can you just go in and say I want to interview Anne Dowd and, and the independent will just what pay for you to go to the well no uh, so in fact <laughs> the, the, the the um <laughs> Oh, how do I put this? Um, so <laughs> that did happen, and they were. And uh, firstly, the independent are good. Like if if you because I've been there for so long, it buys you favor, I guess. But like if you are if you mm -hmm. come in with a great pitch, and you want to interview someone, and it's like it seems like it will be worth the time mm -hmm. that it takes them to like, sh they will say yes. Um, but the and one was I kind of sorted out my own travel. Let's just say, um, to get there because I was like I want to interview that. Sorry, yeah. and uh, you're a mega and Dowd Stan is what you're saying. <laughs> you will not find a bigger and Dowd. She's <laughs> very good. Respect, She's yeah. brilliant, and this is kind of before everyone kind of realised it, I think, as well. So it's like they were like, "What on on her people?" But it is a case of you just email the rep, and you just go. And um, this isn't just and Dowd. This is like it's happened with a few other people as well. And to be honest, it's happened more over Zoom recently because of mm. COVID and everything. Um, and but also that helps my bank balance because you know, a lot of places won't fly you out. And it is like you've got to try and kind of, you know, find your own means. Um, but uh, you email the rep and you just kind of say, I write for this place. And you kind of pitch to the rep briefly and they'll come back and they'll go, yeah, or well, no. And sometimes they just say yes. And it's brilliant. And it's great, you know. And I think with me, the independent, his, it's such a good kind of place to have in my email, you know. <laughs> Because you, you, you kind of people read the email, so you get replies, and you're like, "This is really cool." Sometimes it doesn't work out, but sometimes it does, and you're like, "What?" And I feel like a fraud still to this day when it does work out. No, well, I need to check that interview uh, out. Then it's out there. It's the Andad one the was years one. ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Into LA's into it. it was for Handmaid's Tale um, season two, and then I got to the interview, and she was like, "She was like, honey." what you've come all this way i'm not gonna do an impression <laughs> i was like yeah and she's like have my ticket to the premiere so like, i don't need to go you have it so i literally had a her her ticket and i took some the guy who'd never heard of the handmaid's tale with me who's an airbnb because i spare ticket and he drove and he's in la right so i was like do you want to come he's like sure and then he t 10 minutes into the show he looks at me he's like what is this show <laughs> this is horrific but anyway we yeah she um she gave me her ticket and had a great night and it like, made everything worth it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bet, I yeah, bet. It's great. Um, I'm just, are we all good for time? Um, yes, I, I'm i aware that I've been speaking a lot and this is really for members here to be asking questions. So I will open up to the floor. We already have one there, front row. We have a roving mic, by the way, so do put your hands up. Hi, Jacob. Hey, Sophie. Um, so my perspective is coming from someone in the same industry as you. Um, and I was really, it, wanting to follow up on something you said about, well, first off, film journalism, not feeling quite like journalism, but also because you are someone who has to get news stories. And something I found extremely frustrating um, is that because access to talent and keeping the relationship going is such a huge consideration, it's actually very difficult to ask meaningful questions, mm. um, important questions, actual journalistic questions to do with meaningful things as opposed to like kind of fun stuff. And I just wanted to ask you how, how yeah, like how you approach that tension and like, what are your tips for getting the scoop? Getting the scoop. Um, I, I love going into that room and speaking to someone, but I kind of, it doesn't bother me that they're famous or that they're on screen unless it's, I actually get nervous around di directors more than I do any actor. So if it's an actor and you got, oh, 
that's kind of a split in it there, isn't it? But like for me, I think I go in and speak to them like I would speak to any person and already that kind of puts them at ease or surprises someone or whatever. And for me, I just feel like I'm fairly personable person and friendly and quite smiley. And I feel like they don't think I'm trying to get something from them because if I get a scoop, it's not necessarily like I'm trying to get dirt and that might ne- not necessarily be what I've been told by an editor or someone. They might go, mm, you got to kind of ask this question. And I'm like, okay, I get that we have to ask that question, but I think there's another way of asking that question without it being so obvious what I'm trying to do because they would have had however many people come in that day and do the same thing. So for me, it's about just trying to find alternative means in a way that I don't think anyone else could have done it apart from me. So... Just to clarify, and obviously, yeah, you're like, you're very personable, more like a Columbo than a kind of like <laughs> Paxman. But I guess I'm not talking about scoop on personal mm. lives. I mean, like, the industry is so broken in so many ways. Yeah. There's so many issues. And really, that is what, like, you know, actual journalism should be about. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, and I guess I like, I, I wonder how much scope and leeway you, you have to do that as one of the few broadsheet papers. Sure. Um, I think it does vary, and I think we we have a we have a wide, we have a large breadth of writers now um, of different ages, walks of life, and what I really like is that the independent now, specifically speaking about the independent, I think we've got a bit more clout now. We didn't because we went digital a month after I joined, which is what got me the job, but we we it took us a while i think to get to where we are now so we now get more time firstly which is hard as 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 you will know it's hard to get that time you know usually you get like 15 20 minutes you're like what can i do in that time now it's more like 35 to 45 but i think we we send the right person to the interview you know it's not there were times i'm sure me me and you would agree with me where i got i got i went to, i got sent to interview like jessica chastain and I was like, I shouldn't be interviewing Jessica Chastain because there's a lot of questions I think that w- it would actually come better from a woman, if I'm honest. And I'm not the person who should... She might open up more to someone. She was lovely, but like it, it wasn't the best interview. It wasn't the best use of any of our times. But now I think working at one of the few places that does get the time given to it, which we had to work for, I'd say, by the way, still, it was like, they're always like, the Guardian, the Guardian, the Guardian. And you're like, yeah, but, you know. Um, I think it helps that we've got a, a large crop of writers to pick from and they send there and then and then the fruits of of you know i think you it's fruitful because you read the art of the piece and you see there's been a great link between a person and that's an editor's job you know i i do help out there going i think this person would be really good and we've got other people on the desk but ultimately it's the editor's decision to go that would be the, that would be the best person for that well i think it, the independent when i mean there, there have been it's gone through a few editors and i would say at times, it burnt a lot of bridges with those people for being a bit too blunt with questions. The head and, stuff. And, and the headline we we and, used and headlines choosing and stuff like that. There were, with the, you know, there have been some very very angry emails and some PRs who, when I was there, they just wouldn't work with us anymore because we they'd ask questions and stuff that no they the person didn't like or something, and that would that would damage just the. I mean, it damaged relationships and it just made it it made it tricky. So it, it, it's a really I know what you're saying because it's a really hard balancing act. Every time I've ever tried to write something real, I uh, end up getting it softened. And yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, this is like I, I I think again, it's like an editor's job to be able to to manage that and find the the walk the tightrope that needs to be walked because I think there's a there's an element of like someone will say something and then they might email afterwards and just be like actually we don't want to say that can we not put that in the piece and then i mean i had it even at like total film like we weren't we're not i mean we're a film magazine you know we weren't going for like massive scoops on just like you know hard hitting stuff it was more the scoop for us was like uh, when's uh who's the cameo in the marvels um you know something like that and it was very different but you know, they were. T- I remember something to do with. Um, it was like Scream Five, and it was talking about one of the people who's like. There's one of the people who's in the franchise who wasn't in the new one. I can't remember who it was. I had it was our, my, our Christmas party, and we had the PR screaming on the phone down to us, being like, "You have to take this down now." And this was like, it's like we know this person's not in Scream Five. It's public information. 
and we've just like asked the directors a question they answered it they answered it very well as well there was a very like completely normal question you know normal answer pr on the phone just being like take this down it. yeah yeah they'd said it and they were like like and i we i was lucky because i was with jane and we were just like we we were both just fuming just like why is this person so angry mm. um and and, th- and we didn't take it down and then and then pa- and then uh, no universe whoever it was just wouldn't give us another interview for like a few months and then eventually they were just like we were like well and we did all this stuff on top gun for you as well like surely that means something and th- and it was just this negotiation about it and it was like sorry i feel like i'm we're, we're negging on prs and stuff but that, like well, it's no, just it's, it's a two dis- it's dis- balancing act around that it's just i've got a question for you just quickly one back we could talk after but like is it a case of you've asked the questions you've got the answers and you put it in the piece and then it softened when it comes back to you via an editor. Okay, I mean, well, this is like, I guess, very recent actually, and I won't name the publication. Um, but I, yeah, I, I put some context into mm. uh, a review of a film. Um, so it was like the Marvels. Mm. And I just put that it was like jarring to see American accented superheroes positioned as the defenders of our collective humanity at a time when the American par- president is cheering on a genocide. And the editor was as, like, as nice as she humanly could be about it. It was like the best case version of this situation. Um, she was like, okay, so the choices are we we can pull it and you'll get paid in full or we can run this cut and she sent me a cut. Um, and it was like, again, it's like that absurdity. You're like at a Scream 5. I'm like, this is the Marvels. And it's like, you know, yeah. we're hardly here at like the kind of like the hard edge of political journalism. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, yeah. And I did, yeah, I, I guess I just, I just find that I, that I like that re- really weird space that film journalism is in where we're like going around saying we're journalists, but like, it, f- it feels quite difficult to have any journalistic value yeah. as opposed to some kind of like extension of, yeah, the like celebrity industrial complex mm. and PR and stuff. I think it's really tricky because there's some stuff depending on especially which publication I'm writing for, you kind of have to write for that publication in a way where it's like, I know, like for that observation, for instance, I would, if it w- was going to total film, I would say it probably would maybe get taken out or something. And that's just the weird place of that it's a publication that's supposed to be you know about kind of like sharing the love of movies and be based around that and always going for that and it doesn't necessarily go into the hard hitting stuff. i would say most film mags especially the big commercial ones don't kind of hit on that area and you kind of have to be lucky to be able to write for a publication where you can get into that i think the indie was a publication where you can touch on that i mean clarice lockery who's the reviewer there is very good at kind of touching on that kind of thing and I mean, I look at I've seen uh, public Roisin write like stuff. Who's a music journalist, and it's like zero star, like blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just feel like that it does depend on outlet and the bravery of the editor, and whether they're like willing. Not that it has to be brave, but I guess they're worried about some form of backlash or whatnot. And it's not that it's right, but it's just I guess it's dependent. I guess it's, it's the bigger issue of, of the press in general yeah. at the moment. Yeah, we it? we've had a, we've had a few nightmares at independent where we've written something that or run an interview or someone said something, uh, and I've kind of. I think we all would have agreed with it, but because of the wider connotations, perhaps, or the debate, it's led to literally someone getting sacked, like someone quite mm-hmm. famous. And it's like, wow, we, and then, yeah. So I guess there's conversations to be had. It's annoying though, because you feel like you're getting kind of. I think, I mean, it's it's a very, very important debate. I think it, it, it across the entire media world, to be honest. Um, I'm just conscious of time. Yeah, it's sure. something that's worth discussing in the book. Just <laughs> We will have uh, time at the bar to chat. This is the whole point of this evening. Have a drink and talk with each other. Um, so I'm aware uh, this gentleman here had a question and then I'll come to you uh, and you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, okay, I'll come to you straight after. Apologies. I'll be short. Uh, right. Totally different question. Let's say for the sake of it that I'm... Uh, I'm an independent filmmaker who's made a very small film, kind of all on his own, and uh, and I screened it in minor festivals and uh, and some self-organized screenings, um, independent cinemas, and I would love to reach out to have some reviews or magazines or things like that. But then, in that case, who and how would you advise to reach out to? Mm. Well, I think um, a it's it's extremely tough because. You know these publications don't as as much as we can talk about all the colleagues we work with there aren't that many of us and and uh, as i kind of said earlier writing about something new is very tricky 
but often the way to do it, I'd say, is if you have a good, if you have a good story around it, if you have something that's interesting about the film and unique, that is kind of, it, I'm talking mainly about like on a news level, trying to get someone to write about it. There's probably a good way to kind of get in, um, because I, I guess the thing, like again, when I was at TF, you know, we would get sent, I don't know, probably. 20, 20 films a day kind of thing where it's just, you know, there are so many people. It's like, oh, watch my short film, watch my long film, you know, feature, whatever. And it's so tough. And, and you kind of need that. You need something that's unique and sparks your interest and really makes you go, wow, that is something unique and different. And I haven't seen that before. It's interesting or or something like that, which I know is really hard to do. And, 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 and But it needs to kind of have that, something that that stands out although i will say that you know rather than going for places like the independent stuff it's worth going for the smaller blogs and building up the anticipation around it on like a more kind of like groundswell level and try, trying to build into it rather than just going straight for the big places because the big places like it they it's hard like they're they're writing you're writing about like love island half the time yeah so there is a like lot of that i mean i've tried to <laughs> stop myself from doing Sorry. that which is which is fortunate but though i i what i'd say about independent was i would say don't pin your hopes on getting a review in independent because it's probably not going to happen but if you can find a new a news angle that might be a way of around it because it, you know it doesn't really take that long to run your story we can get you on the phone we can get a director on the phone if if but i'm saying the news angle i have to then pitched that to someone so they it's not me so i could do it want to do it but it's not necessarily me who gets the final say so so if you find that angle if you do the work for me basically and then i can and then get your phone write the news angle and then you've got you know people are still are reading it and in many ways it's better than than a review do you know what i mean like in terms of like starting out so that, that would be my yeah I, i'm trying to think of an example of like something that would maybe happen like <laughs> i guess there have been things often horrors are really good genre for being able to write about on kind of like a mass level and write to anyone about yeah, like if, if, if someone if there's a horror film at a festival and, and someone, someone passes faints, out yeah right oh my That's god the story the story is written you're like oh thank god for that person you could stage that <laughs> yeah you yeah. could <laughs> that's a great idea yeah, people are throwing up in the aisles even if it's just someone who's just like accident it, it's too drunk <laughs> but it's like oh, yeah. someone did that that's a story like it's stuff like that where you it's quite soulless yeah, but it's, it's hard. Like, it works. <laughs> it works. But 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 the, like I would say like the smaller film blogs and the people when you, when you offer yourself for if you're like a filmmaker or something and you're offering yourself an interview and stuff, especially those smaller blogs, you kind of build up through that stuff. And then if like you sent someone sent me an email or something, and then I googled it and saw I don't know like hey you guys or someone's written a small interview and then you can learn a bit about it you're like wow that actually sounds really interesting yeah. blah, blah blah and then it kind of goes from there and there and there and it's that slow build it's really tricky just as they go going cold with like the indie or the guardian or times or whoever and, and just be like can you review my film because they're already reviewing five films a week and ironically I know we're running out of time. I don't, I don't want to waffle on myself but more people might read it at a smaller place than they would at a bigger place, which is really interesting. You'd be surprised. You know. um, I'm going to go um, to you, sir, here, and then I'll come to you at the back. Thank you. Um, thank you. Actually, my question pretty much follows the last question. Um, you mentioned if the film has got something unique or special or different about it. So I'm an actor, so we're okay. I'm not a director. Um, uh, recently, um, a film's been released, about to be released. It's the final edit. It's been done. The trailer's ready. And the thing about it, to my mind, that makes it unique to something that's worth writing about, even perhaps an independent, is that it's a film about a guy that used to be in the adult film industry many years ago. He's now retired and he's having problems and stuff. Now, the special um, consultant on the film was, in fact, the former porn queen of England way back in 20 years ago, who most recently has been known, um, having been taken over by the FBI, to um, uh, be interviewed in front of the, well, witnessed in front of the grand jury in America in the Ron Jeremy trial. So there's a big link there, and so she was a huge help on the film as to how somebody in that industry would become. Now, within that, would that be a story to print? Secondly, would you watch the trailer which I can show in the bar afterwards? 
<laughs> and, would, uh, <laughs> and would you watch the scre- come to the screening, the private screening? Well, uh, I, I definitely watch a trailer in the bar. Okay. Firstly, yeah. um, so I think you know, the human interest angle. It, it's right there. You're ticking some boxes. Yes, yes I'm. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, again, it's not. It's it's just one of those things you pitch, and if it takes the interest of of an editor, uh, uh, but I think it seems like something that might. Is what I'll say. I mean, the, the person concerned has a, a, some big PR because she's been in the press for many years. Right, 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 right. So she's got good PR contacts. Mm. But what w- I mean, she obviously, she's not in that business anymore. She's doing a lot of stuff now and working with the Met Police and working with the NHS on sexual crime and stuff like that. Um, so she's been more into the, the quality press, like your stuff, rather than the red tops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, so uh, it was that sort of angle that does that sort of. Well, off the, off the, b- off the bag, what you're saying, I think something that I know does well at The Independent, or uh, and I'm sure you'd remember, it, it is like the story behind yeah, yeah. something. Um, so, yeah, it's like, w- it's I can't like say for sure, you know, but it's those kind of... Intri- yeah, it's, um, I mean, when, when we're talking about the kind of like the interviews behind it and having someone, if like this woman was available to be interviewed and stuff. It's oh, that certainly, s- absolutely. It, whereas no that problem. sort of stuff that kind of gives it that extra level of just attraction for for a writer to be able to talk about it um and you know if you can if you can make a kind of have a, a sexy headline that you think well is going to work just around just to it, add on that she did a big podcast recently um about an hour long and we're also in discussions with two film directors about making a film about her life so there's a, there's a huge backstory really? yeah. About yeah. It. yeah well i'll well, box the trailer out there okay thank, yeah. you. <laughs> thank you very much and um, there's a question there how are we doing for time how many questions 15 do we have more minutes. 15 more minutes okay we can fit in two or two or three more Thank you. Hi, I'm a writer performer on um, a small YouTube channel called SideQuest 2023, and we're blundering Jamie. into the big time with uh, half a million views very quickly. And um, what I was going to ask you is: is the technology seems to become invisible to everybody else except those on the team who who have to deal with it every day, but. When you say you, you do the Lost Boys podcast, I, I know we can't talk about the content because that's that's so complicated, but but in just terms of, of what package you have and, and, and how it's set up, would you mind just detailing that a little, please? Oh, Lost Boys. I mean, you have no idea how it works, do you? I talk... See, I don't either. And then <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know if it's remote or you guys are in person. Well, so we, we, talk us through that. Oh, we used to do it in person all the time. I mean, we saw w- when we started it, it was rubbish. It well, sounded well, awful. Well, let me say, we started it. We, what we did still is was rubbish. we, well, <laughs> we would be at the Independent, right? And we were honestly so close to the Independent, but there was a sound booth. There was a studio there, and we would just... We'd cram in. We'd book it out. <laughs> <laughs> we'd use it. We'd use what the... It's kind of everything I've done... To even yeah, now, we used, it we used microphones, and then we and then we were there together. And then I would edit it on on Logic on on our Mac, and then we'd upload it to SoundCloud. And then from there, we had it kind of go. Now I do it onto Anchor, which is the Spotify thing. We put it on, and we record remotely now, though. So it, it used to be together, but now now we. But Abba has no idea, side. so it's gonna sound good. We just uh, we must have great chemistry. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's not the same though. No, uh, we're gonna I get back to doing it yeah. But yeah. If you if you want to talk about Lost Boys, we, if anyone does, we can talk about that. We can outside. go all I'm day. happy to. Yeah, really. I can't. So I mean, Jacob's watched Lost what like eight times. Yes. Is it? Yeah. I've never watched Nine it. That's there. the premise of the can podcast. Can I have a show of hands? Who here has watched Lost? Oh, it's uh, that's right. <laughs> that's four, which is a cursed number. <laughs> oh God. My God. <laughs> Um, do you want to just mention what I guess your question was about what so equipment? Yeah, yeah. Used to equipment. Take the software, j- just just getting into it. Just just how hard is that? And, and, and to it's make it's it. not too hard. I mean, the I you we used to use. Uh, God, I can't even remember now. But I mean, we do it all over Zoom now, basically, where you can just record it on there, and we both have microphones. You have like a Yeti mic, and I have the, the, the same thing. So we just literally plug it in with a USB and, and get going, and then I cut out the ums and ahs or I've started to I didn't used to and now I cut out the ums and ahs and, and, and kind of put it together with a few EQs and that kind of thing in the software it's called um, yeah I use Logic Pro on Mac so it's it it, it like it, the way I learn most of these things is, is just through YouTube <laughs> but we um, don't put it on YouTube do we? no we, no. we just put it on to the sound car you know all the, all the, the usual p- channels yeah, yeah the podcast things so we can chat loads more about Lost in the Bar after. Yeah, like really. Um, <laughs> I will talk about that. <laughs> Do we about. have um, any other questions? Yes. Uh, third row, please. Hi. 
Hi. What upcoming films are you excited about releasing? Oh. Well, I'm really excited Napoleon. to see. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I think Ridley hasn't directed a good film in years. Oh, so. bollocks. I really <laughs> hope to finally see The Zone of Interest, the Jonathan Glazer film, just because I've heard so many good things. Oh, I saw that the other day. Oh. Banging movie. To about outside. Um, what else? What else is coming out? My, I saw Maestro, the Bradley Cooper I film. Like that. In, I thought it was amazing. I loved it. I, I, the Boy in the Heron, Studio Ghibli, great yeah, film. All of Us Strangers. Have you seen that? Seen it tomorrow. Oh, are you? Um, yeah, I, I'll tell you something I was really excited to see, and I saw it, and I'd really recommend seeing it over Christmas if you can. And I, I, actually, I don't know if it's out until January, though. It's annoying. It's Terrifier The Holdovers. <laughs> what do you say? It's a Terrifier 3. Terrifier 3. <laughs> the Holdovers, new Alexander Payne film. Um, like such a return to form for him and such a great even in January we love it it's very wintry um, 70s feeling and they kind of shot it like it's filmed in the 70s really good performances like Paul, having Paul Giamatti back in the Oscar race for me is like we need him in the Oscar race every year <laughs> um, so yeah that's that's one what about you what are you excited for um, I'm looking forward to watching Les Miserables Oh yes, uh, that yeah. too. I've not seen that one yet. Yeah. Playing it here at the Gun Cinema. Wow. Yeah, Should point. we all just see it after? Is it gone tonight? Well, <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. I'll have a think of some more. I can't think off the back of my head. It's tricky. We, I feel like when, when you're working at like a magazine, you kind of do, sometimes you do the interviews and then you just forget that the film's even coming out one day. You kind of just, it, you kind of ticked off that box and then you're just like, okay, I'm done, moving on. And then you go like, oh wait, I need to watch Rebel Moon. <laughs> Yeah. Like what? It, oh. Well, the weirdest one is when you, if you go to, unfortunately, go to Cannes sometimes. And when I go, you, some films don't come out for two and a half years to three years afterwards. And you're looking and you're like, wait, oh, I've seen. You like go to a screening and you're like, oh no, I've seen this, um, which is funny. <laughs> when has yeah, that happened? It happened like twice. Go on, what are they? Um, it happened with RMN recently. Mm. Brilliant. But I sat down and I was like, I've seen this and I'm quite tired, so I might not <laughs> see it again. And I loved it. Sorry. And it happened years ago for something else. So like, like, I think it was, uh, no, I'll tell you what it was. It was um, Return to Soul <laughs> on Mubi. And I watched it again because it was on Mubi. And I was like, this looks great. I watched it. I was like, I saw it as a can and yeah. I loved it. And I watched it again and I loved it. You also watch, what, how many films do you watch a month? 60, 70? I try and watch a film a day because I feel like I will literally die bef before watching every film I love if I don't. <laughs> so, hey. I watched one today, actually, even though I was busy. I was busy, but I was, had to fit one in. It was a 68-minute film called One Mile From Heaven. Um, and it was made in early 30s a guy, by a guy called Alan Dwan. Really good film. And it was on quite... Uh, yeah. Was, yeah. Where can we find it? Well, it was actually <laughs> on Criterion Channel, and I kind of have a VPN situation <laughs> going on. So um, do we have... Me. I don't know if we have one, t one more question, or are we running out of time? Yeah, yeah, we're going to do one. Okay, brilliant. Um, gentleman had a hand. And as I said, we can always chat in the bar afterwards anyway. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, so I, I was wondering how websites like Letterboxd have impacted your work. Like, do you use it? Do you find that people are d seeking their reviews elsewhere now at all? Well, I mean, yeah, we both, well, you're a prolific Letterbox user. Yeah, but not very widely followed or anything like that. I just use it a lot. And I have to preface it by going, I promise I do have a social life as, as well. Yeah, <laughs> but but no, it's a really good question because I love Letterbox and I've got a lot to say about it. So. Well, I th I think reviews, film reviews in particular, have changed so much. I don't I don't know if it's because of things like Letterbox because I think it's that's almost like a social media. It's a completely separate thing. It feels like, uh, though I think people in general, I I I guess the bigger impact is stuff like Rotten Tomatoes and Metacritic. You know, people go to those websites and they go like, "Oh, this film has." But Rotten Tomatoes has got a bad rep now. Why? Well, it, it, it it's slowly getting people there. People use it. Uh, yeah, people do use it. I, people, guess. I think like general public. You know, you look at like a, um, you know, some of these like big blockbuster films, and they all have you know they're at like eighty, ninety on 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 Rotten Tomatoes or something, and you go like, "Well, this is a three star film." And it's and something like Austin Powers Two has forty five percent, and you're like, "What?" Don't get him started. Austin Powers, Lil Nicky. Don't get him started. And uh, but it, it, you know, this is. But it is like it, it's having a big impact because you go like, oh man, that film must be amazing. It must be a, a four star, five star. And you're just like, well, no, it's not. And I think it impacts the way films are even being made today. And you, you know, because people is you can make everyone happy and get have a well reviewed film. But if you do something that's divisive, and maybe some people give it five star, some people give it one star. You know, all of a sudden, that's probably a, a, a 50 or a 60 on Metacritic or whatever. And 
and that impacts the film in a big way and i think it's impacting the what the movies that are getting made today and that's the biggest impact and and reviewers i mean i guess i guess to look behind the curtain a bit when when we were i remember when i started at the independent and so nine years ago now and the the guy who was in charge of it was long gone uh it was when it was a newspaper and he used to go don't we don't do three stars he was like pick a side pick two star or four star which i always quite enjoyed they still do that in other places don't they, they do do that in places but it's like it's it's quite fun because it's just like yeah like do something that's going to say like make a point but then now when i if i think about it, i'm going to write a three-star review i find that the hardest because you have to toe that line in the middle of actually writing a three-star review which is which i it's just really hard because like you, it's really easy to be like hate something or i love something and then being in the middle it's like oh, i have to balance this but people are less inclined they see free and they're less inclined to read it right i, I think that that's the thing yeah i mean this is the, the impact of the internet on reviews isn't it yeah where it's like say Detention something big like like you look at like robbie collin at the telegraph he gives I, a lot like like things i would give five stars five stars but i love that he does it because yeah it, it, it makes you want to read it because I'm like, what are you mad? So it makes it entertaining as a as a kind of review to read, and so I implore you to like read these reviews and read them properly because it's just like, if it's it's just fun. Like some people are just so good at having fun in reviews, mm -hmm. and I think sometimes that's lost. Where you know, I, I, I this is why this is why I like let letterbox because I think you can curate who you read right and this is the thing i think a lot of people have suddenly find letterbox where they're just like review bombing or they're they're giving everything five stars before it's even come out and you look at the average score and you're like wait what this is mad but you yourself can curate what your profile shows you right and there are so many good writers on letterbox who if, if anything if i was a writer starting out i would be like for god's sake because i can't the way some of those people some of those users write on letterbox about films you're looking you're like that would have taken me like a week and you've seen it and about two hours ago and you've written that like you're re this is re you're really good so there's suddenly this like mega oversaturation of amazing writers out there who now letterbox is getting money pumped into and is doing really well and i'm really i'm really happy it is it's just gonna make it quite tough in another way for a lot of burgeoning critics so i'm gonna say completely opposite thing of jacob and say that i, I also think there are i think one of the the biggest issues i have with I think everyone should put their writing out there and do it. But I also think people need to realize like just because you could, you know, everyone writes all the time. We're always writing emails, writing texts, doing it all the time. So everyone thinks they can write, but not everyone can write. Yeah, but Jack, like, there are people who can write on it. I know, but I think great. like <laughs> being, you uh, sorted them out, you'd find but, them. But being like a critic and doing it like on a daily basis, like so many of these people do is a real, real skill. Yeah, and it's, there's a beauty to it that I think is, you know, you can't get on some of those websites because it's like these people are watching like five films. They're reviewing five films a week. They're writing in a certain way. You know, you look at like, uh, you know, places like Little White Lies and, you know, all these film mags and you go like, this is actually really special. This is worth paying for because journalism is worth paying for. Sure, like but good to say, to say that there is there are people who write for these outlets who if they weren't writing for these outlets would probably write because they love the film so much and they've got, you know, it's a great outlet place to put your writing they would put it on a place like letterbox so there are people there who are pro would probably yeah. be deserving you know I, there are i'm not saying there aren't there are still good people out there but i still think that there's, there's like lot. there's something very special about like a lot of these writers on a different level which is like look i agree with that i think we've reached an impasse because i would agree that there's not there's no there's not someone on letterbox who i would go to for the final word currently or whatever maybe there would there would be if i kind of put more stock in it but i have more stock in it than you do because i have so much fun scrolling going oh i wonder what this person who i've never met who i don't even know their backstory would say about this film and i'm reading it and i'm like this is so this is better than anything i could write i mean some people are just very funny on there that's what i enjoy yeah i enjoy me, the memes. I'm, I'm all like the piffy one-liner yeah. and then people don't like that that's why i got no they, they like to are you on Letterboxd? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Imagine, stop no, I hate it. After. <laughs> um, we're going to stop there, I think, because we're, no. we've run out of time. But thank you so much. There will be a scope to ask questions, talk, chat, uh, argue, everything out in the bar uh, over a drink. Just I just want to thank you so much for all being here <laughs> yeah, with us today. Thank you to our guest, Jacob and Jack. Thanks, thanks again for joining thank us. Thank you all for coming um, out. Oh, my God. Just a quick shout out before we wrap up. As you uh, are members, 
please do let us know if you have any um, suggestions or requests for these kinds of events. We, we like to have them thematically. So if you want us to bring on anything from a casting director to location scout to an animator, do say so and we will uh, bring you only the very best. <laughs> have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.